Welcome back. Um, today we're going to be talking about dispensational salvation as promised. Um, last week we talked about dispensationalism, what dispensations are, um, the meaning behind them, and how dispensations allow us to rightly divide the Word of God. And as promised, this week's Bible study video is going to be about dispensational salvation. And then again, next week we will go into hyper dispensationalism, which is something that we want to avoid. But I want to familiarize you with that so you know what to look for and what to stay away from. Um, so hopefully you've been following along in your Bible. Hopefully you have your Bible with you right now. We're going to go through quite a few verses. Um, so you'll want to have your King James Bible with you. And I say King James because um, if you go back to my very first video, I told you that I am a firm believer that God's preserved word is in the King James Bible. And actually two weeks from now, we're going to do um, a Bible study video on the King James Bible, why you should use the King James Bible. Um, not only that you should use the King James Bible, but that you should only use the King James Bible. I am KJV only. I don't believe in mixing the other perversions with God's preserved word. If you have an NIV, NLT, anything other than a King James, you need to get, need to get rid of it. It's, uh, it's poison. And we used that illustration before in uh, one of my earlier videos about how decon is only just a small percentage poison. The rest of it is good food. But it's that little bit of poison that kills the rat. All right? So... We'll do a video on that two weeks from now on King James only. So if you're following along, and I hope that you are, uh, following along in your Bible, um, I hope it's a King James Bible. If not, you need to get one and throw out anything that is not a King James. All right? So, as always, well, except for last week, but mostly, we always start off with our core verse, 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 4 that is the gospel by which we are saved and we'll circle around back to that but I want that up there and I want for you to take a look at that when you can if you're not saved this this right here is the means by which you are saved hi Zoe I see her back there over that way anyway first uh, Corinthians 15 1 through 4 the means by which we are saved during our dispensation the church age and we'll be going through that shortly. Um, and then, of course, we always talk about Romans 3.25, which is kind of like the sister verse to that. So we'll circle back around to this. Um, I encourage you, if you're not saved, to get saved. And what does it mean to get saved? Well, it means believing on the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. The atoning blood of Jesus Christ is death, burial, and resurrection. That is how we get saved. Remember, that's twofold. There's the who and the what. We need to know who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh, and what he did. He died on the cross, and his blood washes our sins away. All we have to do is trust on that blood. We'll get to that later on. I went ahead and drew the timeline already because it's a little more complicated today than what we usually have because we're going to be covering a lot of ground. We're going to be starting from the beginning and going all the way up until the end. All right, so let's get started. Um, the first verse I want to take you to is going to be in Genesis. Um, why am I doing a video on dispensational salvation? Well, because there are a lot of people, preachers, uh, pastors, teachers, that teach that no matter where you are at in the history of time, salvation always came the same way, the way that we get it now, through faith in Jesus Christ. There are people who teach that all throughout the Bible, salvation was always the same. You would come to salvation the same way. In fact, I've heard preachers say that in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to the cross, and now we are looking back to the cross. Now. That's partly true. We are looking back to the cross. That was nearly 2,000 years ago. But how could these people be looking forward to a cross 
when the cross wasn't even in existence. Okay, it wasn't until the Romans came along that the cross came into play. That was their form of execution that was unique to the Romans. Okay, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, they didn't know anything about a cross. Okay, they could not be looking forward to something that they didn't know about. Okay, that wouldn't make any sense. So, we want to, um, first I want to make sure that this is working. Okay, sorry about that. I didn't see my light flashing, so there it goes. Just wanted to make sure we're recording. Um, so anyway, they could not be looking forward to the cross. There's just no way. They didn't know that that was the means by which the Messiah would be executed. All right? What were they looking forward to then? Well, they were looking forward to the promised seed. The promised seed that God had given to Adam and Eve when they fell from grace. Take a look at Genesis 3.15. Now God is talking to um, Adam and Eve and Satan because they all played a part in uh, the first sin. <clears throat> okay, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with the story. Um, and we'll touch on that in a second, but this is God kind of summarizing how salvation would someday have to come, uh, but he's only given us a piece of it at this point. The only thing that these people back here had to look forward to was the promised seed. Say, okay? So Genesis 3.15 says, and this is God speaking, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall be it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now that's given us an idea, okay, of what salvation would be and how uh, salvation would come into play later on. But at this point, all it is is a promise for a seed, a promise for a future Messiah. All right. So when God is saying, um, I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, her seed, that is what all these Old Testament saints were looking forward to. That seed, which would someday come and bruise Satan's head. All right? That's what they had to look forward to. No mention of a cross, because that hadn't come into play yet. All right. So, in a lot of ways, um, I, I, or in a few ways, I should say, I can agree with the premise that all throughout the Bible, people came to salvation in the same way. Um, in the sense that it was through God's grace, first and foremost, that any of us could get saved. Okay? So let's put that up here. Um, through God's grace, all throughout the Bible, it was, it's always been through God's grace that salvation is even offered to us. Okay? And then also, um, it's always required a blood atonement. Okay? Blood atonement has always been necessary for the washing away of sins. All right. So in that respect, yes, salvation throughout the Bible was always the same. But there's some more to it. And we'll go through that and find that out. But let's take a look really quickly at Hebrews 9.22. Hebrews 9.22. So I'm going to go back to the, uh, the New Testament. I'm going to write these verses down. I just remembered. Hebrews 9.22. And what does Hebrews 9.22 say? And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So, yes, in that respect, salvation has always been the same. There has to be a blood atonement. All right? So I can agree with that to that extent. 
Let me write these verses down that we've talked about already. And I'm kind of running out of room already, but that's okay. I don't know why I didn't think of this before, um, but this here, uh, dry erase board, you can flip it, which would give me more room. So I, I'm not sure that I want to put the verses on this other side. I'll be flipping back and forth a lot, but I may have to. Um, we'll see. But for future reference, um, I just need to keep in mind that I can use the other side of this whiteboard. All right. So our first verse was Genesis 3.15. And I'm just going to start putting them up right here. So the first one is Genesis 3.15, and then we looked at Hebrews 9.22. Alright, and now we're going to go to Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. And we've talked about this verse uh, before, probably in just about every video that, that I've done, we've come across this verse. And that's because it gives us uh, biblical proof that dispensations are biblical doctrine. So Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So God, at sundry times in diverse manners, spoke. Okay? which we talked about last week, just means that at various times, in different ways, God spoke to different people, okay? That's what dispensations are. And dispensational salvation is an extension of that. So that's why this is the next video. All right, so we're jumping around a lot, but let's go back to Genesis. Genesis 2, 7. Genesis 2, 7. Genesis 2 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So God's telling us about the creation account, uh, the creation of man, and the first man being Adam. All right, so what happened after that? Well, let's go to Hebrews, I'm sorry, Genesis. We're still in Genesis 2, excuse me, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So he created Adam and then he placed him in the garden of Eden. All right, so let's put those verses up here. Genesis 2, 7 and now Genesis uh, 2, 15. Where do we want to go next? Alright, so Genesis 2.15, God placed Adam in the garden and uh, he creates Eve so that Adam will have a helpmate. Alright, so now Adam and Eve are both in the garden of Eden. All right, let's go to Genesis 3.1. I put it up here already. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. This is the beginning of the deception. This is where Satan is getting to Eve and tricking her, basically, into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had given Adam and Eve one commandment. All right, we talked about this in the last video. They had one commandment. And that one commandment was, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or you will die. And Satan comes along and kind of twists the words around and says, Hath God really said that if you eat from this tree, you'll die? And he continues with that line of reasoning, and Eve eventually eats the fruit and also uh, gave it to her husband, Adam, and he ate for it as well. 
He ate the fruit, I believe, because he knew that if he didn't, his wife would be taken from him. And Adam uh, is a type of Christ, okay? Adam ate of the fruit to die for his bride, just like Jesus would die for his bride, which is us. But it's a story for another day, but I believe that. So Adam dies for his wife. Did they die on that same day? Well, they died spiritually that day, okay? Physically, they were still alive, although and they did live, they did live to be close to 900 years, or actually over 900 years. But remember, uh, a thousand years is as a day, a day is a thousand years in the eyes of the Lord. So to, to God, they did die in one day, that same day. But definitely, um, spiritually, they died on that day. So if they had one commandment in order to maintain that right relationship with God, okay, if they broke that one commandment and now they're separated from God, then their salvation or how they became saved or stay saved was based on works. They had to keep one commandment, right? And if you have to keep a commandment, if you have to do something or avoid doing something to keep your salvation or get your salvation, then that's works. So they had a works-based salvation. They had to keep one commandment, and they didn't do it. So they were, of course, banished from the Garden of Eden, but their salvation was based on works. Okay? So... They sinned, and God had to do what? There had to be a blood atonement for those sins. For that sin. Alright? So God made them skins from, I believe, a lamb. Which is, again, a picture of the lamb of God, Jesus, who would die for our sins. So, God made them skins to clothe themselves. But a lamb had to die, maybe two lambs, had to die in order to cover the sin of Adam and Eve, okay? And later on, when uh, Cain and Abel uh, brought their offerings to God, okay, Abel brought uh, an animal sacrifice, and God accepted that, all right? Uh, Cain brought his fruits and vegetables and offered that to God, and God wouldn't accept that because it's not a blood atonement. It was not a blood sacrifice. If you've ever heard this saying, <clears throat> you can't get blood from a turnip, it stems from that. It stems from that, that Bible story. All right. So Adam and Eve, Adam, had to work to get and to maintain salvation. He had to keep that one commandment. Do not eat from the tree. Is that where our salvation comes from? Has God ever came to you or anyone and said, do not eat from a certain tree or you'll lose your salvation? No, of course not. Because it's not based on that. Ours is not based on works. And we'll get to that later. But that's the contrast. So anyone that says that salvation has always been the same through the Bible, I agree that it's by the grace of God and it requires a blood atonement. But it's not the same. Okay, if it was the same, then we would have to do everything that is instructed in the Old Testament. We would have to do everything that these guys all had to do. If salvation is completely the same, and has always been the same throughout all of human history, then we have to do what they were doing. And that means that we better find a tree that we're not supposed to eat from and avoid it. That's what we would have to do. Let's go on to the next one, Noah. All right, let's go to Genesis 6-7. Genesis 6 7. Let me write that down. Hopefully, you can see that. Write these down. And like I said, hopefully, you're following along. Genesis 6 7. What does it say? And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. So God's going to destroy the world because there's so much evil going on. In fact, it says that there, there was nothing good um, going on in the world at that time. Every thought of man was pure evil, uh, aside from Noah. Noah found grace 
Okay, let's read the next verse. Excuse me, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So again, yes, grace has always been extended to uh, people throughout history. That is part of salvation, and I agree, again, that that is something that's common for salvation, no matter where you're at in the Bible, along with the blood atonement. All right? So, Noah found grace in the eyes of God, but it was not through faith, but it was through works. And what do I mean by that? Well, he had to build an ark. Okay? So, Noah had to build an ark in order to be saved from the coming destruction. Had to build an ark. Okay? The only way that Noah could be saved from the impending destruction of the world, okay, was to build an ark. So his faith, or I'm sorry, his salvation didn't come through faith, it came through a work. He had to build something, okay? Had he not built the ark, he would not have been saved. His family would not have been saved. In fact, if Noah had not built the ark, the rest of us wouldn't be here right now because it was through Noah and his wife, his sons and their wives, that the rest of the world was repopulated. Okay? So if Noah would not have done this work, not only would he have not been saved, but none of us would have come into existence. That would have been the end right there. So his salvation was not just through faith. Yes, there was grace extended to Noah, but his, his salvation came through works. He had to build an ark. And I guarantee that God has never spoken to you and told you that in order to get or to keep your salvation, you need to build an ark. Just like he's never told you not to eat from a certain tree. Okay? Uh, Noah did have to have faith. He had faith that God would protect him and his family if he built the ark and they got on the ark, okay? So there was a condition and it was a work. So yes, there was some faith involved, but it was a faith plus works, mostly the works. He had to build that ark and he had to get on it, all right? So moving along, now we're at Abraham. I abbreviated it as Abe, just so it'll fit on here. Uh, let's go to Genesis 12 verse 1. Genesis 12, 1. All right, Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, now that's Abraham's name before God changed it to Abraham. All right, so Abram, Abraham, same person. Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Uh, so God's telling Abraham, in order for me to work with you, in order for me to, uh, to save you, you need to leave where you're currently at and move to a land that you don't even know about, which we've come to know as the promised land. So, Abraham had to obey and move in order to get saved. Okay? God needed him out of the land that he was currently in and needed to move him to which would become uh, the promised land, which was at that time the land of Canaan. Okay? So Abraham has to move in order to uh, maintain a good relationship with God. He had to have faith that once he got there, the land would actually be there, and that God would lead him safely to that place. But he had to move. He had to obey and physically move from one spot to another. Now, has God ever said to you or anyone else, in order to get saved or maintain a salvation, you need to move from where you're currently at to another location that you've never been to? Of 
Of course not. That doesn't happen. And again, if salvation has always come the same way through the Bible, then we better start doing some of these things. We better start doing all of these things. Okay? Um, let's go to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, verse 1. All right. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went to the place of which God had told him. So now, not only does, um, does Abraham have to move to a new land, in order to uh, be saved. Now, he's being told he has to sacrifice his son. Sacrifice Isaac. Now, thank God that we no longer have to do that in order to get saved. Okay? If you've been told or you think you're hearing something and you believe that God has ever told you to sacrifice one of your kids, you're not, you're not hearing God. I can, tell you, I can guarantee you that right now. But if you're one of those people that believe that salvation always came the same way throughout all of history, this could be a problem for you. Okay? I pray you don't actually sacrifice one of your kids, but if you honestly believe that your salvation is the same as how all these other guys had to obtain theirs, that's part of it. Okay, Abraham had to sacrifice Isaac. Now, he didn't end up having to do it. As he was about to plunge that knife into Isaac, God stopped him. Okay, but that was a condition of Abraham's salvation. Okay, uh, Why would God ask that? Well, first of all, like I said, he was tempting or testing Abraham. Okay? And it's not that God didn't know if Abraham would do it or not. He already knew. But sometimes God will give us a challenge or an obstacle. Uh, not so much because God needs to know what we're going to do. He already knows. It's so that we can realize. Okay? We can come to find out how we would react in a certain situation. It's easy to say that you will do something, okay, but when it comes time to actually prove it, uh, that's a whole different story. And that's the case right here. God was testing Abraham so that Abraham could find out for himself if he really and truly would do anything and whatever it takes to remain in a right relationship with God. And Abraham passed that test. And if you notice, okay, he didn't end up having to sacrifice Isaac. Instead, God provided the lamb. But this is a picture. God's telling Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, because later on, God would sacrifice his own son for us. Okay? Again, we talked about that before. This is a type of what Jesus would do later. This is a type of a blood atonement of a son having to die for the sins of others. Okay? Now, like I said, God ended up providing the lamb. Okay? So, Abraham didn't end up having to sacrifice Isaac. But it was painting that picture. Alright? Let's go to Genesis. Uh, let's see. Well, we did Genesis 22.1. I didn't write it up here. So now let's go to Genesis 22:11. Don't want it up there. Genesis 22:11. Genesis 22:11. What does it say? And the angel of the Lord called up, 
called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So again, that's just reiterating what I just said. It was a test for Abraham, but also it was a type of Jesus. Okay? The sacrifice that Abraham was going to make, sacrificing his only son, is the same thing that God did, you know, thousands of years later with Jesus. All right? Um, here's the thing I touched on last week. Uh, a lot of people who believe that salvation has been the same all the way throughout the history of the Bible, they point to Abraham and, and they point to the fact that uh, righteousness was imputed unto Abraham because of his faith. And that is true. Okay, let's go to Romans 4, 3. Well, we're going to find out, we're going to see, it's not the same as how it is now, okay? Because it was a different dispensation. Romans 4, 3. All right. Let me write that up here. Uh, Romans 4, 3. What does it say? For what hath saith Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. All right? And it later says, too, that he was justified as well. But this is where the difference is. When we get saved now, when somebody gets saved during this age that we're in right now, this church age, you are imputed righteousness. All right? I'll put that here. I'll put it in blue. So when you get saved now, you're imputed righteousness. And you're justified. Okay? And that happens all at the same time. Okay? Happens at the exact same time. When you get saved, when you trust on the blood of Christ, you're imputed righteousness, and you're justified. And all of that is through faith. Your faith in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Death, burial, and resurrection. Alright? Was it the same for Abraham? No. It does say that he was imputed righteousness. Abraham was imputed righteousness because of his faith, because he believed God. But, but, when he was justified, it came at a separate point in time. And it came through a different means. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go over to uh, James 2. Go to James 2. James 2. And we're going to read 21 through 24. So we've got James 2, 21 through 24. All right? James 2, 21 through 24. Let's read that. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, but by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. So his righteousness came through faith, because he believed God, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. So now we got something. We got two things going on here. First of all, like I said, when we get saved, we're imputed righteousness and justified all at the same time, and we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians two eight nine, um, or no, I'm sorry. Uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Okay? When Abraham was imputed righteousness, it was because he believed God. It was because of his faith that he was imputed righteousness, but his justification came from a separate event, 
And it was because of his works, because he was going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Okay? So, his righteousness was imputed because of faith, but his justification came by works. Faith plus works. That's how they got saved, even back here. Faith plus works. So it's not the same as what we're doing. Okay? We don't have to do works to get saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. All right? Uh, let's go there. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And maybe hold your finger there in James because we're going to come back to that. But Ephesians 2, 8, 9. What does that say? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, again, this is where you get turned around, you'll get your doctrine all mixed up, and you'll, you'll see what appears to be a contradiction if you don't follow dispensations. Because Paul tells us that, right there in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that our salvation is through faith alone, not of works, not of works. But James says in 2.24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Well, isn't that a contradiction? Well, it would be if these people were right in saying that there are no dispensations and salvation always came the same way. Well, then there would be a contradiction in the Bible. But there are no contradictions in the Bible, not in the King James Bible. It's because James is talking about a different dispensation. James is talking to the Jews who will go through the tribulation. Okay? That's who James is talking to. And at that point, and we'll see it later, salvation is going to come differently than what it is right now. So, Abraham, yes, was imputed righteousness for his faith. That is true. But his justification came by works. It's a faith plus works. And that is not where we're at right now. Different. All right? Uh, let's see. Let's go to uh, Romans 4.22. Romans 4.22. I really want for you to see this. I really want for people to understand that uh, salvation did not always come by the same means. Yes, there was grace. And yes, there was a blood atonement. But the way you got saved and the fact that you had to maintain your salvation which we no longer have to do, once you're saved, you're always saved, is completely different, okay? Romans 4.22, what does it say? And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Again, going back to Abraham, all right? It was, uh, righteousness was imputed to him through his faith because he believed God. But his justification came through works. So it's faith plus works, just like here. Noah had faith, and he found grace in the eyes of God, but he had to work. He had to build the ark. Adam, he had faith in God, but he had to keep one commandment, don't eat of that tree. And when he did, it cost him his life, and it cost him spiritually. Okay, And it put a curse on the earth. We're still feeling the ramifications of the sin that Adam and Eve committed. All right? Moving along, you know what, um, obviously uh, Moses, I was going to do David first, but I guess we'll do Moses. All right, Moses. So we're moving along. Now we come to a guy named Moses. Moses is, uh, Moses led the, uh, the Hebrews out of Egypt, and, and the law was handed down from God to Moses. So that brings us to this period right here, where the law is in place. All right, people are under the law. Um, so let's uh, take a look at that. And let's go back to Exodus. Exodus 20. Let me write that down. We're not going to go through all of it, but just starting in verse 3. All right. 
and you should be familiar with this. Uh, these are the Ten Commandments, okay? So, God told Moses that the Jews, the Hebrews, were going to have to keep the commandments, okay? You could lose your salvation if you didn't keep the law, okay? So, in order to get saved, in order to maintain your salvation, you had to keep the commandments. Now, there's the Ten Commandments, but eventually, there would come to be 613 different laws that the Jews had to keep, okay? Which was impossible. Nobody could do it. Nobody can do it, okay? So, what happens, or what happened, if they broke one of these laws? If they didn't keep one of the laws, or if they broke one of the commandments, what would happen? They had to sacrifice an animal for a blood atonement, okay? Uh, however, if they sinned again or broke another law, they'd have to do another blood atonement. Every time that they sinned, they would have to do a new blood atonement, which is different than how we are right now. Christ died once for all, okay? For every sin that you've ever committed, past, present, and future, Jesus knew about it when he willingly went to the cross and died and shed his blood for you. And when you trusted on that blood, his blood washed away all of your sins, past, present, and future. That's why you cannot lose your salvation, okay? However, here, you could lose your salvation whenever you broke the law again, whenever you failed to keep any or even just one of the commandments. If you did that, you would have to offer a new sacrifice each and every time because this blood atonement was animal blood, and it didn't wash your sins away, it merely covered it, okay? It just covered their sins, and that's uh, uh, a Bible study for another day, but that's what prevented the Old Testament saints from going to heaven. They went to paradise, okay, but they could not go to heaven, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, so through Moses came the law, and the Jews uh, should have said that, right from the, from the start, they should have said, we can't do this. Maybe they would have been, maybe they would have found grace like Noah did. Maybe they would have been under grace instead of the law. But they, in their pride, I guess, decided that they could do it. Yeah, we can keep those commandments. So they placed themselves under the law. Um, most people will agree that there's a difference between being under the law and being under grace. So if you recognize even that, then you cannot possibly believe that salvation comes the same way. That's a contradiction in terms. You wouldn't be able to do that. So the Moses, or I'm sorry, the law came through Moses. So we move up a little bit farther to David. So what we're saying here is, under the law, yes, you needed to have faith, but you also had to perform works. You had to keep the law. You had to keep the Sabbath. Okay? There were a whole bunch of laws that you had to keep. And if you didn't do that, you fell out of place with God until you offered up a blood atonement, an animal sacrifice. Thank God we don't have to do that now. So moving along to David, David is obviously in this period still under the law. All right? Um, it talks about how David at various points would receive, receive the Holy Spirit, all right? And at that point in time, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit would come and go. Sometimes he'd, he would, uh, the Holy Spirit would fill somebody, and then the Holy Spirit would leave. Okay, it talks about Saul, for example. The Holy Spirit came upon him, and he started prophesying. But then the Spirit left, and later on, a demon entered into Saul, and that's why he became such a, a horrible king. Does that happen now? When you get saved, does the Holy Spirit sometimes just leave and it's possible for you to be possessed by a demon? No. It says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Ephesians, and I'll put that up here. 1, 13, and 14. Let's take a look at that, actually. Ephesians 1, 13.
All right, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit would sometimes come upon somebody and they might start prophesying or give them insight. But then the Holy Spirit would leave. Okay? The Holy Spirit came later after Jesus ascended into heaven. He said that he would he would send a comforter. Okay? And that's the Holy Spirit. And when you get saved, the Holy Spirit enters into you. And you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You cannot lose your salvation. Something. Like no, it's not the quiet. Punk. Um, so you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and that is why you cannot lose your salvation. Back here, as we just read, the Holy Spirit would sometimes come upon somebody and then leave. And in the, in the case of Saul, the Holy Spirit had come upon him and he started prophesying, then the Holy Spirit left, and later on Saul uh, fell from God's grace. Um, he quit following the commandments. And a demon entered to him, entered into him. That doesn't happen to us now. If you are saved, there is no way that you can be possessed by a demon, ever, because you're already sealed by the Holy Spirit. All right. So that is yet another example of how it's different. Um, here, the Holy Spirit could come and go. Here, once you're saved, the Holy Spirit stays. The Holy Spirit will never ever depart. Uh, let's take a look at Psalm 51.11. This is a good one. Psalm 51.11. And this is David writing. In 51.11 he says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now why would David be asking that the Holy Spirit not be removed from him? If he was sealed with the Holy Spirit, then it would be out of the question for the Holy Spirit to be taken from him. But he's asking, please don't take the Holy Spirit from me. And that's because the Holy Spirit could come and go, and did come and go. In fact, the disciples at a certain point got a taste of the Holy Spirit before, okay, the Holy Spirit came and indwelled within them. Jesus gave them a taste of that, okay? And back here, the Holy Spirit could come and go. That's different than what it is now. So if salvation has always been the same, then we are not sealed by the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 is a lie. Because if it's the same now as it was back then, then that means that the Holy Spirit can leave any of us at any time. There is a difference in how you got saved and in the maintaining of your salvation. And for anyone to say anything differently, they're not rightly dividing the Word of God. And that's a problem. All right, um, Ephesians, back to Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4, verse 30. Right, Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That's not what happened back here. The Holy Spirit could come and go. David was praying, don't let it leave from me. Here, in Ephesians, Paul's telling us, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. What's the day of redemption? When Jesus comes back for us. The rapture. Okay? Again, this is Ephesians 4.30. Oh, I should have put the other one in there too. Psalm oh, 51.11 And now Ephesians 4.30 So hopefully you can see that. Hopefully you're writing these down and or following along. So, sealed until that day of redemption, the rapture. When you get saved, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That didn't happen back here. Therefore, it's not the same. Okay? There's this expression that on its face seems obvious, but 
uh, it, it, it actually makes a whole lot of sense. Things that are different are not the same. And, and on its face, like I said, that seems obvious, but things that are different are not the same. Yet people will tell you salvation is the same all the way throughout the Bible. And we're finding out right now that's not true. It was different. It was faith plus works. David had to do faith plus works. He too was under the law. He had to keep the law. Okay? The Holy Spirit could depart from him. Okay? He prayed that it wouldn't, but there were times I'm sure when it did. When he uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba, I'm pretty sure the Holy Spirit wasn't there with him. Okay? Not to say that if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can't sin. I'm just saying it was different here than what it is now, okay? All right, let's look at one more verse uh, in regards to that, Romans 10.4. Romans 10.4. Why is it so important to know this? Well, The reason is because if you believe that salvation was the same all the way through, that is probably why you believe you, you can lose your salvation. That is probably why you take verses out of context. That is probably why you believe that, um, we, are, that we as a church are going to go through half or all of the tribulation. That's why this is important. And also because we're going to talk about future times. What, the, what salvation is going to mean, what it's going to look like, how it will be obtained. And for those of you that are not saved and for whatever reason refuse to do so, when we're out of here and you are going through the tribulation, I want for you to know that it's still possible to get saved at this point, but it's going to be different than what it is right now. So that's why this is important. All right, Romans 10, 4. You see, if you believe that salvation has always been the same throughout the Bible, then you're not rightly dividing, first of all. Secondly, you're going to get your doctrine mixed up. You're going to come across what you believe to be contradictions, such as the difference between what Paul said and what James said. Okay, You're also going to probably believe that you can lose your salvation, because there are verses that do say that. But again, those are different dispensations, not ours. And you're probably going to come to the conclusion that we, as a church, are going to go through part or all of the tribulation. Your doctrine is going to be wrong. That's why this is important. But also, like I said, in the event that for some reason you still don't get saved during this period of time right here, when we rapture out of here and you're left behind to go through the tribulation, I want you to think back to this video and remember when we get there how you get saved and how you have to maintain it. We're not there yet, but that's why this teaching is important. Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The law ended when Jesus came on the scene. And we'll get to that in a minute. But up until that point, all these people from the time of Moses were under the law. Okay? Different than where we're at right now, which is under grace. All right. Let's take a look at the next... The next person on our timeline is John the Baptist. So we're jumping ahead a little bit. All right, John the Baptist. Uh, notice it's John the Baptist, not John the Methodist or John the Calvinist or John the Lutheran. It's John the Baptist. Just, just pointing that out. We'll do a study on that at some point, too, um, about the real uh, church. Okay? There's three lines of thought. I'm going to go on a tangent for a second. Um, there's the Catholic Church, which claims to be the original church, or the oldest church, okay? And then you have your Protestants, and they broke away from the Catholic Church, okay? Luther, okay? So that'd be like the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Pentecostals, Charismatics. There's so many of them now. And then you have your cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, those are all cults. But if you really follow the true line of the church, going back to the time of Jesus and the disciples, you'll find that that is the original church of Christian believers. And you'll find that the only church 
that I've come across so far that comes even close to that are the Baptists. So the Baptists precede the Catholics, and they definitely precede uh, the Protestants, and they have no part in the cult at all. Okay, just a side note, John the Baptist, and we'll do a study on that at some point. All right, so John the Baptist, let's go to Luke 16.16, 16. Let's see what we can find out about John the Baptist, Luke 16.16. 16. Because we're going to find here that even though uh, John is ushering in this, uh, um, this new era, he's pointing toward the Messiah, things still aren't exactly the same here for, under John the Baptist's ministry as what it is under Paul's ministry. And we'll take a look at that. All right, Luke 16, 16. And it says, the law and the prophets were until John. So I'm just going to read just that first part. So the law and the prophets were until John. So when John the Baptist comes on the scene, that's the end of the law. The law ends at John the Baptist. But again, that doesn't mean we're to this point where we are right now under Paul what was revealed to Paul, there's still some transitions that are going to have to take place here. We're at John the Baptist. The law has ended, but let's see what John the Baptist says. How do we get saved? How would people have gotten saved here under John the Baptist? Well, let's go to Mark. We'll go there first. Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Mark 1.1. 1, 1. What was John's ministry about? Well, Mark 1.1 1, 1 says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John the Baptist, his whole ministry was pointing toward the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He was trying to point the Jews to their Messiah. Okay? Yes, he was trying to get people saved, and he was ushering in a new era no longer under the law, but his point, his goal, his ministry was to point people, the Jews, to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. All right, let's take a look at, let's go back to Luke chapter 3. And it says, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That's Luke, I'm sorry, I'm going to need to write that down. Luke 3.3. 3. Luke 3.3. 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That's John the Baptist. Go to verse 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Verse 18. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. Again, this is talking about John the Baptist. So I talked about eight. We'll just put those ones. Luke 3.3 3 and Luke 3.8. Under John the Baptist, he was teaching that in order to get saved, you had to be baptized in water, and you had to repent. More specifically, actually, I'm going to take that off there. I want it. More specifically, baptized in water and confessing your sins. Verse 
Is that how we have to do it now? Do you have to confess your sins before you can get saved? Do you have to get baptized in water before you get saved? Now, see, this is where, if you're not looking at dispensations, entire churches are are founded upon uh, John the Baptist ministry, and we're no longer there. Um, for example, the Catholic Church believes that you have to be baptized in water and confess your sins before you can get saved. That was true during the time of John the Baptist's ministry. But we're over here now on the other side of the cross under the ministry of Paul, which was revealed to him through Jesus Christ. And we know that salvation is by faith alone, not of works. Being baptized in water, confessing your sins, those are works. works. This is different than where we are right now. And if you're not rightly dividing, again, if you're not looking at dispensations and dispensational salvation, your entire doctrine, your entire church can be based on something that no longer applies to us. Okay? You're not rightly dividing the Word of God and you're misleading people. You're convincing people that they can lose their salvation and that they have to be baptized in order to get saved. And that is not true at all. Paul says that salvation is by faith alone, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is why this is an important teaching. All right, John, let's go to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Verse 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. Again, John's ministry was about baptizing in water in order for people to get saved. They had to uh, wash away their sins, baptism in water, confess their sins, and then they could get saved. Yes, there was some faith in what John was preaching, pointing them toward the Messiah, Jesus, but they had to work. They had to be baptized and confess. We don't have to do any of that now. You do not have to be baptized to get saved, and you do not have to confess your sins to be saved. All right? It's different there than what it is now. Okay? Now let's move up to Jesus and his ministry. Now, again, I always want to point to for salvation... There's two parts to salvation now. There's the who and the what. Who Jesus is and what he did on the cross. All right? Well, just taking the who for right now, Jesus is God in the flesh. Okay? Jesus is God in the flesh. That's important to know. All right? Matthew 15, 21. I don't think I'm writing these down. I keep forgetting. Well, I'm about out of room, so you're going to have to write these down for yourself, okay? Hopefully you're following along and writing this down. Matthew 15, 21. Let's go there. Matthew 15, 21. Jesus is talking about his ministry, Okay? All right, Matthew 15, 21. Actually, let's drop down to 24. There's a whole story there, but let's just drop to 24 for sake of time. All right, but he answered, Jesus, and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus came to the Jews only. Jesus did not come for the Gentiles. He specifically told his disciples when he sent them out, do not go into the cities or the dwellings of the Gentiles, for I have come only to the lost house of Israel. Just like right here, 1524, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was Jesus' ministry. His ministry was to the Jews only for the nation of Israel. Does that apply to us? I hope not, because if so, then we as Gentiles are still lost. Jesus didn't come for us, okay? He came for the Jews, all right? Now, eventually the Jews, they rejected their Messiah, and that's what brings in this parenthetical age that we're in right now. But initially, 
Jesus came for the Jews. He was preaching about the kingdom. Let's take a look at some of that too. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. So let's look at Matthew 4.23. What does that mean exactly? Preaching the, the gospel of the kingdom. Well, Matthew 4.23 says, And Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Alright, go to Matthew 9.35. Matthew 9.35. What does that say? Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. What is this kingdom that Jesus was preaching about, that he was teaching about? The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven was his millennial kingdom when Jesus sits upon the throne. That's coming eventually. But had the Jews not rejected Jesus, had they accepted Jesus as their Messiah, this millennial kingdom would have come way back here. Okay? But because they rejected their Messiah, the millennial kingdom was pushed out. Okay? And we got this parenthetical age right here called the church age. Alright? But Jesus came to the Jews. That is who Jesus, that's what all throughout the Old Testament, God was working with and through the Jews. And Jesus was no different. Jesus was a Jew preaching to Jews. And again, if you don't understand that, if you don't understand that, you can get your doctrine turned around. If you don't understand that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are primarily Old Testament books, then you will definitely get your doctrine turned around. Okay? There's a lot of good stuff in the four Gospels. I'm not saying to avoid it. You should read those. But a lot of that is Old Testament. It takes place before Jesus was crucified. And the Bible says that the death of a testator ushers in the New Testament. So the New Testament starts here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are over here. Okay? Old Testament. And if you don't realize that, you're going to get your doctrine turned around. Matthew 24 is a prime example. We've gone over that. People look at Matthew 24 and they think that applies to us today. It does not. That is Old Testament and he's talking about the tribulation period. But you need to understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament books. I understand that they're in the New Testament, but they are Old Testament books. They take place prior to Jesus being on the cross. That is why this is important. All right, let's take some take a look at some more verses. Okay. Matthew 9:35. Let's go to Matthew 9:13b. Basically, that's like the second part of of that verse. Uh, I guess right after the colon mark. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. To repentance. Okay? So here, I'm running out of room. I'm going to move it down like this. Repentance. You had to repent. Okay? You had to repent. And it was for the Jews. It was for the Jews only. Okay? But you had to repent. That's a work. You had to repent. All right? So even under Jesus, and I'm going to put it up here, it was faith plus works. Okay? Repent. And not only that, it was to the Jews only. So it wouldn't have applied to us. Thank God. Otherwise, we'd be left out of that. All right, let's go to John 3.16. Everybody's familiar with this verse. So even though Jesus came... To the house of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, calling them to repentance, and John was pointing them toward the fact that this Jesus was God in the flesh, that he's their Messiah, that they just need to believe on him. Uh, Jesus, because he is God, also knew exactly what was going to happen, and knew that he had to die for the entire world, because eventually he would be going to the Gentiles. So John 3.16 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And again, that kind of harkens back to what we were saying about Abraham having to sacrifice Isaac. Okay? That was a type of what God would do later on with Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay. Mm, I think that's all I'm going to do there for right now. Just know that even under Jesus' ministry, things were different. We're not under Jesus' ministry. Now that's not blasphemy. I'm not saying that Jesus isn't our Messiah, or I'm sorry, our Savior, our Lord and Savior, and that that's not where we should put our faith. That is, we put our faith, our trust, our hope in the finished work of Jesus. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is our hope in this atoning blood that he shed. It's his blood that washes away our sin. However, under his ministry, salvation was different. They were still baptizing. You had to repent. Um, Jesus told the rich young ruler to keep the commandments. Now, even though the commandments and whatever else, the law had ended at John the Baptist, Jesus was still telling the rich young ruler to keep the commandments. Do we have to do that? No. I mean, we should keep the ones that pertain to us. Okay? Keep the commandments. And how do we know which ones pertain to us? They line up with what Paul says. Again, I'll always go back to that. Compare Scripture to Scripture. It is of no private interpretation. And ours, our heart, the heart of the Bible for us is Romans through Philemon. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we are not under Jesus' ministry. Because if so, most of us would be left out because we're not Jewish. So thank God we're not under Jesus' ministry. But thank God that Jesus had the foresight because he's God to know what was going to happen here. So he died for all of the world so that we who are not Jewish can get saved as well. Okay? But it's not the same here as it was here. All right. So now um, let's go on to the church age. In the church age, is uh, as you can see I have a big arc right here for the church age but then there's two smaller ones within it why? well this is because we have Peter and Paul and even within the church age salvation came differently and we're going to find out exactly how that happens now when you're talking about this transitional period you have to go to the book of Acts the book of Acts and when you read the book of Acts, you will see that it's a transitional book, okay? From Jews to Gentiles, and also from Peter to Paul. Jews to Gentiles, Peter to Paul. Acts is a transitional book, and you need to keep that in mind, because otherwise you're going to get your doctrine all messed up again. Um, that's why, and I don't mean to pick on other faiths or other churches or whatever else, but if we're going to rightly divide the Word of God, we need to call people out when they're wrong, whether they're Baptist or Catholic or whomever else. They need to be called out. Now, like I said, for me... I think the Baptists come the closest to the original church. But that doesn't mean I agree with everything that the Baptists say. Not by any means. Okay? But, if you're not looking at Acts as a transitional book from Jews to Gentiles, Peter to Paul, and realize and recognize that even within this church age, there's two different dispensations, Peter and Paul you're going to get your doctrine all turned around, and that's why the Pentecostal and Charismatic churches still believe in speaking in tongues. Okay? That's why they still believe that you can lose your salvation. Because they're looking at what Peter was saying and not what Paul was saying. And that's a big error. That's a huge mistake. All right? So let's take a look at some of this. Um, Acts 2. So go to Acts chapter 2. There's so much to cover. Uh, I sometimes 
I have to leave some stuff out. I don't like to do that. Um, but otherwise, we would never get through it all. When I'm writing these up, of course, I, I, I don't know how long it's going to take to get through them all. But I try to put everything up here that I can. Um, so I apologize because we can't hit all of it because of time constraints. But if you have questions, comments, or whatever else, please contact me either on this video or email or whatever else. Find me on Facebook, whatever. Um, in fact, I, I encourage you again um, to ask your questions, post your comments, but also to please like the video, share it, and subscribe to my channel. And also, you can find me on Facebook, okay? And I'm going to put it, I don't know where, I guess here. It's hard, hopefully you can see this. Facebook, and I'll put it at the end of the video too if I remember, dot com forward slash, spelling it out, Romans 10, 9, K, J, V. Facebook.com forward slash Romans 10, 9, K, J, V. That's my Facebook page, Crown of Thorns. Um, you can leave comments or whatever else there too. Um, but it's the same, Crown of Thorns, just like this, this YouTube page. All right, so I forgot what I was even talking about. Oh, because uh, of time constraints, a lot of times I can't put all of the verses up here that I want. So that's why, you know, um, it looks like sometimes I'm staring off into space. Really what I'm doing is trying to gauge how much time we have and which verses I can leave out which, without uh, sacrificing what needs to be talked about. So I apologize for that, but if the videos go too long, one, I'm still using a smaller SD card, and two, um, if they go too long, um, a lot of times uh, they don't get the exposure that they want. YouTube recommends between an hour to an hour and a half. Otherwise, if it's longer than that, then a lot of times the videos kind of get buried. But hopefully you're sharing the videos anyway. All right, so Acts 2, uh, verse 14. Now, remember, this is a transitional book, Acts. We're going from Peter to Paul, from Jews to Gentiles. So we're under Peter here right now. And what is he preaching? It's going to be a lot different than what Paul is pre will preach eventually, yet it's still under this church age. The Jews have already rejected their Messiah, or will. We'll show that in a second. And so now, uh, Peter, though, initially is still going to the Jews. Even though the Jews rejected Christ and had him crucified, um, they rejected it. They rejected Jesus back here with John the Baptist. They rejected Jesus on the cross. So that's strike two. We're going to find strike three here in a second. But at this point, God's still trying to reach the Jews. He's still working and going to the Jews through Peter. All right. So Acts 2.14 says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Okay? And we won't go into everything that he's saying, okay, but what he what the point being is that he's going to the Jews. Men of Judea, men of Jerusalem, those are Jews. Uh, drop down to verse 28, that same chapter, chapter 2. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Okay? Now, 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Again, Peter's trying to convince the Jews, Jesus is the Messiah you've been looking for. Now, you rejected him twice already. Don't do it a third time. He's trying to get the Jews to accept their Messiah. Because if they had, this millennial kingdom would have happened a long time ago, way back here. All right? Um, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's telling the Jews, look, you fouled up here. You had him crucified. You rejected him back here when John the Baptist was trying to point you in that direction. Don't do it now. He, he, yes, he died. He was buried, but he's resurrected. He is the Messiah. He's God in the flesh. Now is the time to turn to him. Okay? 
36. That's where we left off. Okay. But notice, notice, and we'll get to that in a second here, um, that Peter, his ministry is a lot like John the Baptist. What do I mean? Well, Peter was also going around and telling the Jews that they needed to repent or confess and be baptized. Baptized. Okay? Peter was telling the Jews in order to get saved, yes, you need to believe on Christ, but you need to get baptized. You need to repent or confess your sins. Okay? And until you do those things, you can't get saved. That's not how we are right now under Paul. But under Peter, his ministry is a lot like John the Baptist. Baptized. Be baptized. You have to get baptized. Now, in Acts 7, and we won't read the whole thing, Acts 7, this is kind of uh, strike three for the Jews. In Acts number 7, Stephen is preaching, and he's trying to convert these Jews, and he's taking them through this long history of basically everything that we've talked about today leading up to and pointing out that everything was pointing toward this Messiah, this Jesus, okay? And at the end of it, they still reject Jesus, and they stone Stephen. They kill him. And Stephen, if you notice, um, says that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, in all the other accounts, when it talks about Jesus ascending into heaven, it says that he now sits at the right hand of God. Okay? But at this point, when Stephen is being stoned, Stephen says he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Why is that important? Because again, Jesus was ready at that point. Had the Jews accepted him as their Messiah because of Stephen's preaching, he was ready to come down and establish his kingdom. Jesus would have come down at that point and established his millennial kingdom. But again, they rejected Jesus, they stoned Stephen, and Jesus sat back down, and that's when he stopped dealing with the Jews and switched to the Gentiles. Now, who does he call on to, uh, to, to go to the, to the Gentiles? Well, we know that. Um, it's Paul. But notice, even though Peter was going primarily to the Jews, remember, um, Cornelius, okay? Cornelius was a Gentile, and God sent Peter to, to Cornelius, and Cornelius and his family got saved without being baptized. That's the transition. Notice, under Peter's ministry, when he was going to the Jews, repent, recognize Jesus as your Messiah, be baptized. Again, it's faith plus works. But when he went to Cornelius the Gentile and preached to him, Cornelius and his family got saved and the Holy Spirit came upon them before they got baptized. It's changed. It's no longer, you no longer need to be baptized to get saved. That's why now, uh, I think it's the Church of Christ that believes that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. That's because they're basing their doctrine on Peter. They're basing their doctrine on Peter's ministry to the Jews, which doesn't make any sense. Okay? And that ended, we know that ended, because Cornelius and his family got saved. The Holy Spirit came upon them outside of baptism. There was no baptism involved. Okay? Let's look at Acts chapter 8. Here's another example. No longer needing to be saved. Uh, Philip. Philip was sent to the Ethiopian. Okay? The Ethiopian was reading the book of Isaiah and he couldn't understand it. So Philip helped him to understand. And he shows how Isaiah and all these Old Testament things were pointing toward Christ, this Messiah. And Philip says, what prevents me, okay, from being saved? What prevents me from getting baptized? And Philip says, if you have believed on Jesus, then you can be baptized. Notice that means you get baptized after you get saved. Whereas under Peter, you had to get baptized before you got saved. 
under John the Baptist, baptize before you get saved. In fact, baptize in order to get saved under John the Baptist and Peter. But we're talking about Philip. He's somewhere maybe in here. And he's talking to this Ethiopian and says you can get baptized after you have believed, after you have trusted. So that shows a transition. No longer need to be baptized to get saved. You can get baptized after you get saved, but it's not necessary for baptism. The Church of Christ, they're taking their doctrine out of the wrong dispensation. That's why this is important. So we're transitioning now from Jews to Gentiles, from Peter to Paul, and no longer needing baptism. So let's keep going, because uh, I'm probably just about out of time. Um, in Acts chapter 9, we won't go through all of that. That's when Paul gets saved. That's his Damascus Road experience. Um, and under Paul, of course, like we've been saying, it's to the Paul went to the Gentiles because God, when the Jews rejected their Messiah for the third time, when they stoned Stephen, okay, God set the Jews aside. That doesn't mean he's done with them. God will go back to dealing with the Jews when? Right here, the tribulation. That's when God will go back to dealing with the Jews. So he is not done with the Jews. I do not believe in replacement theology. But right now, God is dealing with the Gentiles, okay? This era right here, where we are, okay? And under Paul, salvation comes through faith alone. Faith alone. That's it. So let's look at Acts 15, verse 11. And it says, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. This is that transition. The Jew, or I'm sorry, the Gentiles can now get saved. They too can receive the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, Acts 16, verse 30. And this is where you see a really big transition. This is where Paul's doctrine comes into play, where salvation is through faith alone. Paul and Silas are in jail, and. Um, the jailer asked Paul. So he says, The jailer brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Saved. Sorry. So what did they have to do to get saved? What did the jailer need to do to get saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. No mention of baptism. No mention of repentance. No, me no mention of confessing. No works involved at all. He didn't have to build an ark. He didn't, he didn't have to move to another country. He didn't have to offer up his son. Okay? If there was no more works involved, it was faith alone. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is the transition between Jews to Gentiles, Peter to Paul, and where it's faith alone. Faith only. Faith plus nothing. However you want to phrase it, that is what it is. So any church that tells you that you have to do anything outside of just believing on the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, they are wrong. If they're saying you need to be baptized, if you need to confess, that you have to keep the Sabbath, that you have to keep the commandments, they are wrong. They are not rightly dividing the Word of God. And that's why this is so important. Dispensational salvation. Faith alone right now. All right, let's keep going. Um, Romans, let's go to Romans chapter 11. How do we know that Paul, um, that Paul, why does Paul belong in the Bible? Because a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of preachers, a lot of churches that, that tell people to disregard Paul because it's too hard to understand his writings. It's not, under, it's not hard to understand Paul's writings. They are so different from everything else that they stand out as an anomaly. But that doesn't mean you disregard Paul. You should not disregard Paul. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. The mystery was revealed to him through Jesus Christ. Okay? What does this say? Uh, Romans 11:13. For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. That's us, the church age. All right. 
Um, let's see. And like I was saying before, we should take all of the Bible. You should read all of it. Okay? There's a lot of good stuff in the Bible that you can utilize. But the heart of the Bible, the heart of the New Testament for us today is Romans through Philemon. Romans through Philemon. When you're reading the Bible and you come up against something and, it, and you're not certain if it applies to us, compare it to Paul. It all comes back to, does it line up with what Paul is saying? Romans through Philemon is the heart of the New Testament for us. Okay? That is uh, our, that's Paul's ministry to us. Romans through Philemon. If you're reading something in the Bible and it doesn't line up with what Paul is saying, it's not that it wasn't important. It was important in, in various times. Okay? And we can learn from that. But it doesn't apply to us. If it does not line up with Paul, you need to keep that in mind. That's so important. That's why people get their doctrine turned around. That's why people have false doctrine. That's why they have churches that uh, preach um, basically what is heresy. Okay, It's heresy to tell people that they need to be baptized in order to get saved. It's heresy to tell people they need to confess or do any work to get saved. That's heresy. You want to avoid that. All right, so when you look at the book of James, James is also a, a transitional book in the sense that James goes back to dealing with the Jews, specifically during the tribulation period. That's why uh, in the book of James it talks about how faith without works is dead. You must do works in order to maintain your salvation because James is talking to the Jews during the tribulation. Hebrews is also a transitional book. Okay, Hebrews is a transition from the church to the Jews. That's why there's so much doctrine in there that will get you turned around if you're not rightly dividing. It'll talk about how you can lose your salvation because in this dispensation, you can. And we'll get there in a second. That's why it's important to rightly divide. Hebrews is a book to the Hebrews, which are Jews. So that's a transitional book. It goes from the church into the tribulation period from Gentiles to Jews, okay? The opposite of what Acts was doing. James is written to the Jews, specifically the Jews going through the tribulation period. All right. Okay. Um, the tribulation period would be the next dispensation, all right? Salvation through the tribulation is going to be different than what it is right now. It is so easy to get saved right now because it's through faith only. Faith in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us. In the tribulation period, you have to die for Jesus. It's going to be way different. Um, the Jews, uh, that's who God is primarily dealing with during the tribulation. There will be Gentiles there too, but he's specifically and more importantly and mostly dealing with the Jews. He's going back to the Jews. There will be the 144,000. There will be the two witnesses. All of them are going to be pointing the Jews to their Messiah, Jesus. Okay? Um, the Jews as a whole will be fooled at first. They're going to think the Antichrist is the Messiah. But about midway through, when the Antichrist breaks that agreement and desecrates the temple, those witnesses are going to be uh, out there. They're going to be preaching to these Jews, and these Jews will finally, okay, the nation as a whole, that doesn't mean everyone, but the nation as a whole, Israel, will finally recognize that they crucified their Messiah, that their Messiah was back here 2,000 years ago, okay? So, in the tribulation, um, well, let's look at uh, Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12, 17. What does it say? Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So during the tribulation, you have to keep the commandments and have faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So what does that tell us? That's a faith plus works. 
What do you have to do? You have to have faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot take the mark of the beast and you'll have to be beheaded. So now you have to die for Christ. That is why it's so important to get saved now because you will get uh, now it's simply through faith in what Jesus did and Jesus died for us. Here, it's going to be tough. You have to die for Jesus. Okay. Um, I think I'm just about... Let me check. Okay. Now a little more time. This SD card that I'm using right now doesn't hold a lot. Um, Revelation, let's look at 14.12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that kept the commandments of God and faith of Jesus. Okay, these are those who were beheaded. They kept the commandments. So again, like you just told the rich young, rich young ruler, keep the commandments. Here, keep the commandments. Don't take the mark. Have faith in Jesus. There are works involved in order to keep your salvation. Okay, here is the patience of the saints. So the ones who are beheaded. Here are they that kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Um, Go back to 13, 17. And that no man might buy, buy or sell, save he, he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Again, the only way you can buy and sell during the tribulation is to take the mark of the Antichrist. That's why it's going to be so very hard. And once you take that mark, at the end of that tribulation period, you're going to be cast immediately into hell. Okay? That... That is a sure way to lose your salvation, is to take the mark of the beast, okay? Uh, Revelation 14, 9. If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. You will be cast into hell. Now, is it possible... Let's say that you're going through the tribulation. You take the mark of the beast because you want to be able to buy and sell. But let's say you come across one of these witnesses, the two witnesses or the 144,000, or you see a video like this, or you find a, a New Testament Bible, and you start reading it, and you decide that you no longer want that. You do not want to go to hell. You want to get saved. You want to be with Jesus for all of eternity. Is it possible, after you take the mark of the beast... To then get saved. Well, if you go all the way through the tribulation, at that seven year end of the seven years, when Jesus comes down to establish his kingdom, if you have that mark, then you're going straight to hell. But let's say it's before Jesus comes back at Armageddon. Is it possible to to get saved after you've taken the mark? Well, I think that it's maybe possible. I don't know for sure. It's an interesting theory. But in Matthew 5.30. I'm going to write this one down because I want you to, to, to remember this. And just take a look at it for yourself. I'm not saying this is for certain. I'm just wondering. Matthew 5.30. Jesus says, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Well, where does the mark of the beast go? If you have a King James Bible, again, this is why it's important. The King James Bible tells you that the mark will be in the right hand or in the forehead. The new perversions say on. Well, that's a big difference. Is it in or on? It's in. Get a King James Bible. So anyway, it says in the right hand. And here Jesus is saying, if your right hand offends thee, well, then just cut that off. It's better for that, that part of your body to burn in hell than for your whole body to burn in hell. Is Jesus saying, is Jesus telling the people, the Jews, he was telling the Jews that, hey, during this time, if you do end up taking the mark, there is a way to get away from that. Cut off your right hand. That were there, that mark is gone. You'll go, you, you won't have a hand, but once you get to heaven, you'll get it back anyway. But is that what he's saying? What about earlier when he says, if thy right eye offend thee, uh, verse 29, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of the members should perish, and not the whole body be cast into hell. Um, if it's in the forehead, I guess getting beheaded at some point would get rid of that mark. 
maybe that's a way to, to, to work around that. But what if, and I'm wondering, this is something I came up with, and I don't know that it's true, I'm just wondering. What if when it says that the mark is in your forehead, it's really an ocular implant that's in your forehead. Your eye is basically in your forehead. Um, what if that's what the mark is? It's either something in your right hand, and by forehead it could be your ocular, an ocular implant. Because Jesus said, pluck out your, your right eye if it offends thee. Again, speculation, I'm not being dogmatic about it. I'm just wondering, it's feasible, that maybe there is a way around that. If you, if you truly repent and you don't want to burn in hell and you want to get rid of that mark, it might mean cutting off your right hand, having your head cut off, or plucking out your right eye. Just an idea, a theory. Um, let's take a look at Revelation 20, verse 4. Revelation 20, verse 4. I'll be glad when I get my other uh, SD card back, because that way there, if I do go along, at least I know it's still recording. All right, and I saw the thrones of they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The people that get saved during the tribulation, they're going to be beheaded. They're going to be killed. They'll go up into heaven, but they're going to come back at Armageddon with the rest of us and go and be here, rule and reign um, during the Millennial Kingdom, like all of us that go up during the rapture. We talked about that before, and I want to get into it now. Um, look at some of my earlier videos for that. All right, so the final one, obviously, is the Millennial Kingdom. Millennial Kingdom. Is it different here how you get saved than how we get saved now? Yes. The only dispensation where it's by faith alone the only dispensation where it's by faith alone is where we are right now under Paul's ministry. So the Millennial Kingdom, what does it say there? All right, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Go to Hebrews 11.1. 1. I want to show you something interesting about Hebrews 11.1. 1. That's a pretty well-known verse. Uh, people say, well, that's the definition of faith, and it really is not. <laughs> okay. That's not what uh, Hebrews 11, 1 is about. It's not giving you a definition of what faith is. People kind of take that out of context. Hebrews 11, 1. All right. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, it's not going to be by faith anymore during the Millennial Kingdom because Jesus is going to be on the earth ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. So it's not faith to believe Jesus is king when you can look at him and see that. See, we believe by faith that Jesus is king, that he died on the cross, that he now sits in heaven. We none saw that. We don't see that. Okay? Um, we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. Okay, we walk by faith, not by sight. These folks are going to be walking by sight. They're going to be able to see Jesus. So, their salvation won't be by faith, because they can see Him, okay? That's what it says. Faith is the, faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's us. The evidence of things not seen. I believe, even though I have not seen. They believe, because they do see. That's not faith, okay? Um, so, Jesus will be on the throne. Salvation will be by works alone. So, in the other dispensations, it was usually faith plus works. A little bit of both, mostly works. In ours, it's by faith only, no works. In here, it's going to be no faith, but works only. Kind of the opposite of where we are right now. What does that mean? Well, they're going to have to keep Christ's commandment. Okay? Um, if they do something wrong, they will pay for it immediately. It's going to be kind of like eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Um, and if it's bad enough, or if you're persistent, remember, during the Millennial Kingdom, you can be kicked into hell at any time. Jesus rules and reigns. Um, it's going to be with an iron rod, in fact. Okay, you don't have much room to mess up. Now, these people have 
a sin nature still, even though the devil's locked in the pit, they still have a sin nature. They're going to foul up. They need to immediately repent and make good. But for the most part, they need to keep the commandments. There's no faith because Jesus is right there. It's works only. I know that's hard to read, but that's what it says. Works only. Ours is faith only. Works only. The rest of them are faith plus works. Okay? And if you... If you're going through this millennial kingdom in a mortal body, is what I'm referring to, you still have that sin nature, you need to toe the line. I said that in a couple of videos ago. Those of us that were saved, okay, and came down with Jesus at Armageddon, we're ruling and reigning over those people. We have immortal bodies, glorified bodies. We no longer have a sin nature. We're, we're good. Um, and we noticed too that during the millennial kingdom, the curse is lifted, okay? So the animals are all getting along with each other. Children are playing with snakes. Uh, lions are laying down with sheep and all this. It's it's great. It's like back here. It's like Eden, okay? And notice back in Eden, there was the tree that we talked about, the knowledge of good and evil. That was the one commandment that Adam and Eve broke. That's what set everything else into motion. The tree shows up again, the tree of life. It kind of comes full circle. It started with the tree, and it's going to end with the tree. Oh, here it is. That's my tree. Isn't it beautiful? It started with the tree, it's going to end with the tree. Okay? And then, of course, at the end of the millennial kingdom, uh, the great white throne, hell is cast into the lake of fire, the old heaven and earth are gone, the new heaven and earth begin, and that's when eternity takes place. And I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait. I can't wait for the rapture. I can't wait. And I think it's coming soon. If you saw my video, uh, if you haven't seen the video, you should go and, 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 and watch that. Anyway, this is what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I didn't get to everything that I wanted to talk about. Um, again, when I'm just kind of staring off into space, it's because I'm trying to guesstimate how much time something's going to take or how much time I even have left on my card. But... This is dispensational salvation. It is, it is imperative that you understand and recognize these and that you uh, know that this is biblical doctrine. This is sound biblical doctrine. There are dispensations. We talked about that last week. Okay, Different ways, different times. God speaking to different people. Dispensational salvation. How were people saved then? How will they be saved in the future? How are we saved now? I think that's imperative. People need to know that. Because if you're confusing these dispensations, you're going to get churches with bad doctrine. Okay? Churches that say you need to be baptized or repent or confess or anything else. They're wrong. All you need is faith. Faith on the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. All right? And like I said, next week we'll talk about hyper-dispensationalism, which takes this to an extreme. And that's something we want to avoid. Okay? And I want to point out the things that you need to look for so that you know uh, false doctrine from true. And then the week after that, like I said, I think we're going to get into why the King James only. All right? Um, if you have questions, let me know. Comment on the video or find me, like I said, facebook.com forward slash Romans109KJV. Uh, find me on Facebook. Um, if you're watching this video, I ask that you would please like it, that you would share it, and that you would subscribe to this channel, uh, my Crown of Thorns YouTube channel, and go and like my Facebook page, okay? The more people like this, the more people share it, the more subscribers I get, the farther these videos will go, okay? That's why, I, I, like I said, I try to keep them to an hour, an hour and a half. The farther these videos go, hopefully the more people we get saved, and that's what we as saved Christians are supposed to be doing, getting people saved, rightly dividing the Word of God. Okay? That's why this is important, and I ask that you would help. All right. I thank you for your time. Uh, have a great weekend. Um, I'm recording this on Wednesday. Of course, it goes up on Sunday, so when you see this, it'll be Sunday. Um, I hope it's been a blessing to you. Um, take care, and God bless.